Thank you for joining us today. I'm Carol Savitz. I'm senior advisor at the Security Studies Program at MIT. And along with Elizabeth Wood, who is a professor of history at MIT, we co-chair the Focus on Russia seminar series. The series that you're going to, the discussion we're sponsoring today is a star forum, but under the rubric of the Focus on Russia series. We've had several uh, discussions already about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we thought today that we would widen our focus to discuss issues such as nuclear security, insurgency, China's role, et cetera. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers now and so that we can, um, we can move right along through the, um, through the, the conversation. Um, and I wanted also to thank, even before I got to the speakers, to thank the Center for International Studies, the Security Studies Program at MIT, and the MIT Russia Program for co-sponsoring our series. So our speakers today are Jacqueline Baba, who is a professor of the practice of health and human rights at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Her expertise is health and human rights and international migration and refugee protection. Joel Brenner, who is a senior fellow at the Center for International Studies, who is the former head of US counterintelligence under the director of national intelligence, and will talk to us today about cybersecurity and data protection. Taylor Fravel is the Arthur and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science at MIT, and he's the director of the Security Studies Program. Uh, his expertise is Asian security and East Asian foreign policy. And as I said before, he's gonna talk about China's role in the Ukraine crisis. Next will be Roger Peterson, the author and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science at MIT, whose expertise is civil military relations and comparative politics and ethnic conflict. Finally, uh, last but not least, as they say, is Jim Walsh, who's a senior research associate at MIT Security Studies Program, who is an expert on nuclear weapons and uh, WMD proliferation. So with no further ado, let me turn the floor over to Jacqueline, who can uh, begin our conversation. Um, thank you very much, Carol. It's a pleasure to join you, um, and thank you for organizing this uh, important event. So, as you noted, I'm going to speak about uh, the refugee um, situation caused by the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I'm going to basically organize my brief comments in four sections, starting with some introductory comments. I'm then going to talk a bit about the response of state actors. Then I'm going to move to some brief remarks about uh, non-state actors or community um, response. And finally, I'm going to talk about particular vulnerabilities of some populations that um, the human rights community is particularly concerned about. But let me just start with um, a couple of intro introductory reflections. Um, as I'm sure most of our listeners know, um, nearly four and a half million Ukrainians have already fled their homes. This is uh, uh, within a month and a half of the outbreak of the war. Some are still internally displaced. Many have had multiple dislocations to multiple settings as conflict and um, insecurity has followed them. And we see this in many conflicts that people don't just migrate or leave home once they go to a place which they think is safe and then are forced to move on. And this has been true in this conflict as well. Um, and I think as again, as has been noted, this is the largest refugee exodus of Europeans within Europe since World War II. If you make a comparison, at the end of World War II, about 8 million people were displaced. This is after six years of war at the end of World War II in Europe. And here we already have about um, four and a half, five million people displaced just within six weeks. So the scale of the human tragedy and the human disruption and dislocation is immense. I do want to note, however, that um, it's not that there haven't been other very massive um, forced migration episodes in very recent history. Um, the number of Ukrainians is not that different to the number of Venezuelans who've been forced to leave their homes. And of course, numbers of Syrians and Afghans have also been in the many millions. Um, we don't have clear figures about Tigrayans, but there's a massive conflict going on in Ethiopia too. So my first introductory point here is that um, this conflict has received extraordinary attention, extraordinary media attention, and there has been, therefore, an extraordinary public response, um, something which is 
in many ways positive, but um, it does also highlight how different and inconsistent our response to human tragedy is. Second introductory comment I wanted to make is uh, specifically about one population, which is children. According to a UNICEF report put out last week, um, over 50% of Ukrainian children have been forced to leave their homes, over 50%. And um, for those of us who work on the links between human rights and migration, uh, this is an extraordinarily uh, significant number because we know that the consequences of forced migration, of conflict, of the sort of disruption that these children are experiencing are not short term. These children are likely going to have um, traumatic impacts, maybe for their whole life. So what we've witnessed in the past six weeks is really the beginning of something that may well um, impact a whole generation of Ukrainian kids. And my third point, um, and again, this is something that I think many of our listeners will be familiar with, is that um, we've also seen uh, not just the consequences of the conflict for expulsion or forced migration, but also for entrapment. And this again is a drug drastic humanitarian situation. I'm thinking particularly of Mariupol, where the reports of starvation and of the deliberate uh, killing or unnaming of civilians in violation of international law um, have been really acute. And I think I'm sure we're going to hear more about this in our panel. But the fact that there is a nuclear deterrent um, in this conflict has meant that many of the most fundamental uh, laws of war are being violated um, with impunity, it seems. So let me move on now to the response of state actors. And um, I think the most important point to make here is that the response to Ukrainian refugees has been unprecedented. The European Union has never before opened its arms and its doors in the way that it is doing now. Um, to speak a little bit more technically, within less than a week of the commencement of hostilities or commencement of the invasion, on March the 1st of 2022, uh, the European Union activated something called the Temporary Protective uh, Protection Directive, Temporary Protection Directive, which is a very important anticipatory move to create a baseline of protection across the Union. This directive was um, brought into effect as, as a piece of EU uh, equipment or, or, or policy um, after the Bosnian war, but it's never been used before. It's never been activated. And I don't think anybody ever thought it would be activated because its terms are so generous. But here we are, as of the 1st of March, the Temporary Prote uh, Protection Directive is now activated across the Union. So what does that mean? It means a couple of very important things. Firstly, it means that anyone who was a citizen or a legal resident or a refugee or someone with, with equivalent legal status um, living in Ukraine on February 24th and who was in Ukraine on February 24th is given permission, legal permission to enter the European Union, any European Union member state, and that they have permission, legal permission to stay in an EU member state initially for a year, and if approval is given, which it is likely to be given, for another two years. So the temporary protection directive means that Ukrainians, unlike any previous group of refugees, have this possible sense of security that they will have three years legally in Europe. That is huge. That makes an enormous difference to one's sense of security and one's state of mind. Um, it's not just that they have legal access. Legal access brings with it some critical um, entitlements, one of which is the right to work legally. Secondly, the right for children to go to state schools. And thirdly, the right to access at least emergency health care and for vulnerable groups like unaccompanied minors and others more than just emergency health care. So this temporary protection directive really changes the playing field for refugees compared for, for Ukrainian refugees compared to, for example, Syrians or Afghans or, or, or many others. Um, 
And another thing I want to comment on is that um, the EU's um, directive is a very good example of a flexible anticipatory policy. It's something that many of us human rights lawyers have been asking for for years, that states should anticipate predictable needs rather than always being behind the curve and acting after um, the needs have arisen. And so by making this declaratory decision and saying that people don't need to apply to be legal, they will be legal if they just register for a residence permit, the EU has set a very high baseline of protection, uh, a baseline which will have certainly psychological and emotional and of course legal impacts for the refugee population. And um, another important uh, related point is that this, um, this approach means that the asylum systems of the different EU member states won't get overloaded because people don't need to apply for asylum. They have a legal residence for at least three years. Um, so that's a really, I think, an important point. There, are, uh, there is a lot I could also say about different member states' responses. I think we've all read how, for the first time ever, Poland and Hungary have accepted that there are legitimate refugees and they have opened their arms. Um, Germany is dusting off the protocols that it used in 2015 for the Syrians and really get coming up to scratch very quickly to institute procedures which enable um, arriving Ukrainians to get inserted into housing, into schooling and so on. And other West European countries have um, really, again, um, demonstrated a willingness to act, which has been um, unprecedented. The Netherlands in particular, which has been fairly hostile to many previous flows of refugees. So the summary point here is that the EU's response is something which sets a wonderful precedent, I think, for previous um, and, and future refugee flows um, and will at least in part mitigate the tragedy that so many uh, um, Ukrainians ha um, have experienced and are continuing to experience. That said, of course, though, the challenge is immense because the scale of arrival and the scale of harm um, and, and devastation are huge. And um, it's been really interesting to observe the ways in which um, communities have responded uh, and, and businesses and local organizations and of course faith and other based um, entities. So for example, Airbnb has made available over a hundred thousand spaces free of charge. Western Union is not charging uh, relatives who are sending money to Ukrainians. Um, uh, teachers are using Apple Translate and other tools to quickly absorb children without saying, oh, we have to put them in special situations because they don't speak the language. All of this is, I must say, unprecedented. And um, there's a kind of ramping up of just making food, housing, protection, uh, mentorship available, which is um, really a, a heroic effort. So any any poll that you speak to, and I've spoken to several recently, will tell you how people are bringing food, are bringing clothing, are standing with placards saying, you know, they have one couch available for a, a single woman, or they have a room available for a family without pets, or whatever it is. So um, a really remarkable response. My final point, though, is, of course, that despite this um, generous outpouring we're seeing many many very concerning developments even amongst this relatively privileged refugee population firstly um we're already seeing retrenchment hungary for example which initially um welcomed these white christian refugees with open arms is now um pulling back from some of the provisions of the um, temporary protection directive. I won't go into details, though I'm happy to answer questions, but there's clearly a sign that that initial sense of, yes, you know, we are in this together is, 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 is um, perhaps fraying. And I think the recent the, the announcement of Orban's election is only likely to, to increase the, the risks to the many refugees who are in Hungary, though I should say there are extraordinary organizations like the Hel Helsinki Committee and others who are working, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
And finally, there are other vulnerabilities that we need to think about, as in any such situation, the, situ the um, risks to women and girls of exploitation, of violence are exacerbated, and we're already hearing concerning reports. And the same is true of unaccompanied minors in these mass exodus situations. Um, you often see abusive adoptions, you see exploitation and trafficking, people really exploiting vulnerabilities. So unfortunately, this um, massive exodus is no exception. So I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Turning it over to Joel. Oh, thanks for having me this afternoon. It's a pleasure to um, address this group. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about cyber network operations, computer network operations in, in Ukraine and in Russia and defense uh, in the United States. I'm not going to talk about cyber war. And I want to discourage the use of that term altogether. We're not in a cyber war any more than we're in a javelin war or an AK-47 war. We're in a war that has cyber aspects to it, and it's anything but a standalone cyber event. Um, what are we seeing now? Um, the the um, enormous amount of destructive attacks by various Russians, not always precisely attributable, but Russia, clearly Russian, to a, a, more than a dozen places in Ukraine. Some of them were in January, mostly in February, mostly pre-invasion, not, not so much during the invasion. Um, in mid-February, the um, UK government reported that the GRU, that's Russian military intelligence, was almost certainly involved in various disruptive DDoS attacks against the financial sector in, in Ukraine. And the Ukrainian um, cyber emergency response team known as the CERT has uh, told us that um, there have been lots of malware attacks on Ukrainian systems, and in one case, at least from, from Belarus rather than Russia. Um, the, the, um, what we haven't seen, however, uh, and I'm now looking at a report from Kevin Mandia from Mandia, because Mandia is speaking publicly and he's one of the few who are actually in the front line speaking publicly. We haven't seen, according to him, so there are better, they're better known groups like Energetic Bear or Berserk Bear or Isotope or Dragonfly. And we haven't seen them out of their ordinary sort of um, patterns of operation. Same goes for Russian Foreign Intelligence, the SVR. And this looks like a puzzle at first, but it's really not. Um, if you're blowing up the hospital and if you're blowing up the power plant, taking out its cyber network really is sort of beside the point, isn't it? So. The, the Russians um, are, are just, they're blowing things up and um, going into delicate, long preparation cyber attacks when you can go into much more destructive kinetic attacks doesn't make much sense. Now, on the Ukrainian side, starting two days after the operations, the Ukrainians announced uh, the formation of an IT army. Um, and that has been quite astoundingly effective. Um, it's, they are fighting digital intrusions and they are fighting back. Uh, Reuters um, in mid-March announced that the um, Russian telecoms firm Rostelcom and Russian Digital Ministry both reported substantial cyber attacks. And there have, if you've been following the news as this audience I think is, um, is aware that the, the Ukrainians have pulled off massive data heists from Russian military and intel sites that have really been seriously compromising. We also know that there have been seven general officers killed in this war so far. That's extraordinary. Now, how has that happened? In at least one case, we know that a, a general officer was speaking on an open cell phone. Now, it's possible that that general officer was being reckless, but I rather doubt it. A characteristic tactic in warfare, communications tactic in warfare, is when, you, when your enemy is communicating in ways you can't find or in ways you can't intercept or decrypt or decrypt quickly enough, one tries to herd those communications from media that you can't intercept or decrypt to open a source communications that you can. I think that's what's happening here. And I suspect that Western intelligence services, probably chiefly CIA, but maybe also MI6 and uh, um, Israeli intelligence, 
have long known where those nodes are of, of, of classified communications and have told the Ukrainians where to put ordnance to blow them up. So I think what we've seen is a herding of Russian uh, secret communications uh, into the clear as a result of uh, network operations, of which we can be proud, by the way. Um, turning to the United States, there's been substantial years overdue emphasis on, on network defense. Um, those of us who used to have hair and were tearing it out over the lack of seriousness in this are starting to really see um, some payoff in this respect. The, on March 22nd, the House passed and the Senate had previously passed a cyber crime bill that uh, requires lots of um, illumination of, of cyber crime, much more heavy reporting. There's also been another bill passed that um, is, going, is making um, American companies much more open about what's going on in, in their networks. It's about time. These steps are not going to prevent determined Russian attempts to penetrate those networks. What they will do, however, is make penetration somewhat more difficult in, 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 in some cases and make resilience greater because the attacks will be reported more quickly, understood better, and then the cavalry, so to speak, the cyber cavalry can go to the aid of those companies much more quickly. Um, the White House is sort of, um, but not clearly denied an NBC report on 24 February that uh, the president has given a menu of options for the United States to carry out massive cyber attacks designed to disrupt Russia's ability to sustain its military operations in Ukraine. I suspect this is true. I also think the White House doesn't wanna talk about it. Um, Basically, US intelligence and military commanders, I'm now quoting the NBC report, are proposing the use of American cyber weapons on a scale never before contemplated. And among the options reported by NBC are disruption of internet connectivity across Russia, shutting off electric power, tampering with railroad switches to hamper Russia's ability to uh, resupply its forces. None of this has happened. Why not? Because we don't want to launch cyber attacks against Russia that under the law of armed conflict could be the, regarded as the equivalent of a kinetic, attack, a kinetic attack and thereby put the United States directly in conflict with Russia. We don't want that. They want it even less than we want it. Besides, they haven't attacked us yet. So the idea that somehow we should be conducting massive cyber attacks in, against Russia when our strategy is not to be in direct conflict, conflict with Russia doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it's not, by the way, because our defenses are so great. Now, nah, of course, the, the Russians could attack us, turning the, um, the question around a little bit. Uh, as Mandia notes, we haven't seen an escalation outside of Ukraine. He says, it's like we're bracing for impact. Everybody's on high alert. This is more of a puzzle. Why haven't the Russians attacked us? Well, for some of the same reasons. Um, and of course they still might, but I think there are several reasons and here's what I think they are. First place, it wouldn't accomplish anything. Putin's goals in Ukraine are not going to be furthered by going into conflict with the United States and, and messing around in their networks. It just won't accomplish anything. Secondly, as the director of um, a D GCHQ, that's the equivalent of British NSA, uh, Sir Jeremy Fleming said only a few days ago, while some people look for cyber Pearl Harbors, it was never our understanding that a catastrophic cyber attack was central to Russia's use of offensive cyber in their military doctrine. Okay, we haven't seen it because that's not how they play ball. Third, it might cross our own red line whether we've consciously drawn it or not. Putin wants a direct fight with the US military even less than we want one with his military. Now, there's a lot of conversation about what if it came to nukes? Serious issue. Um, Russia's military doctrine is that they would use them if Putin thinks his regime is threatened. It's not. Putin is not suicidal. 
a general exchange of nuclear weapons would be suicidal. It's not what he's after. Could he use a tactical nuke in Ukraine or drop one into the Baltic or the North Sea? Yeah, he could. Uh, what would the Chinese reaction to that be? The Chinese are already really unhappy with the Russians for, for, because this is a strategic disaster for them. Um, I think if that happened, we wouldn't necessarily respond with a nuclear response. We would have precision weapons. We might attack launch sites with promises not to do more. That's a, a very hairy scenario, but it's a mistake just to focus on Putin's red lines. Putin's thinking about our red lines, and you should too. His risk of escalation is even greater than ours, because for him, he faces the prospect of regime change. We don't. I therefore would be inclined to send in those Polish MiGs. I would also supply the Ukraine with anti-ship weapons that could sink any ship in the Baltic fleet that got anywhere near Odessa. And it's also worth thinking about not a, um, uh, a no-fly zone, but uh, as Timothy Naftali recently suggested, a no-fly corridor, a humane corridor. Um, we've already blown past one of Putin's red lines. I, I, I think we ought to be, this takes steady nerves, a cool head, but also a stiff backbone. Otherwise, you allow Putin or anybody else with nuclear weapons to make the rest of the world think they cannot be confronted. That would be a strategic disaster for us. Finally, let me just say this about Russian information space. They've really lost the information war externally. Nobody believes anything that they say. The, and the revulsion against Russian behavior is almost worldwide. Um, but Russia... Putin believes that Russia, that the Soviet Union lost the Cold War because they couldn't control their own information space. That is why he has closed his information space. Penetrating it now is one of our great objectives, ought to be one of our great objectives. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joel. Taylor, your turn. Thanks, uh, Carol, and thanks to everyone at uh, CIS uh, for putting this together. It's a great uh, pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, I've been asked to focus on China, and I'm going to try to answer three questions. What has been China's response? Uh, why is China responding the way in which it, it has been responding? And what are the implications of uh, China's response? So first to start, what is China doing? How has China responded to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? As summed up, I believe first by a friend and colleague of mine, Evan Medeiros, you could sort of view the Chinese response as uh, sort of pro-Russian neutrality. Uh, and so on the one hand, uh, China leans very heavily towards Russia, but is not seeking to become directly involved in the conflict or provide uh, substantial direct uh, military uh, support to Russia. So what are the diplomatic, economic, and military components of, of the Chinese response? I think the most sort of noteworthy aspect of China's response has been in the diplomatic realm, which has been to accept and amplify uh, Russia's view of sort of the origins of the crisis, uh, which is NATO expansion. Uh, this reflects Chinese concerns about US alliances more generally, but it is also an attempt to place the onus for resolving uh, the situation created by Russia's invasion of Ukraine on uh, the United States. China refuses to call it a war, um, has never referred to it as, as an invasion, very rarely maybe this sort of references the flames of war, but generally it's described as a situation Jusher or as a crisis, wagey. Um, and so they've downplayed the severity of what's happening. Uh, other elements include uh, somewhat paradoxically uh, underscoring the importance of sovereignty and territorial integrity and the UN Charter. Uh, this is one effort, I think, to nod slightly in Ukraine's direct direction, despite the overwhelming uh, tilt towards Russia. Uh, also with Russia, China amplifies, sort of accepts and amplifies Russia Russian sort of propaganda and talking points, most recently regarding uh, US um, uh, so-called military bio labs in Ukraine. Um, and this is not coming out of like second tier Chinese media, but from the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Of course, there's a refusal to condemn uh, Russia's actions. On, on the slightly more 
perhaps positive diplomatic side, there is generic support for peace talks. Um, although if it's not a war, it's unclear what peace talks are intended to resolve. But I think there is an idea that China certainly is open uh, and would support a peaceful uh, sort of settlement. And then, of course, um, on the diplomatic front at the United Nations, China has um, sort of there's been a little distance between China and uh, Russia, at least in resolutions that were put forward to the Security Council and the General Assembly, which China abstained but did not uh, veto. Uh, the last element of China's approach has been a six point humanitarian plan uh, to provide humanitarian relief. So far, I believe that includes um, $2.3 million of aid that has been provided. So pretty heavily pro-Russia, although trying to strike a somewhat neutral position. On the economic front, uh, China opposes sanctions, often describes them as unilateral sanctions, even though uh, the sanctions are being put in place uh, through, uh, through coordination of um, many states uh, from Europe, as well as uh, those uh, sort of advanced industrialized economies in Asia. But nevertheless, uh, even though China opposes the sanctions, China uh, so far does not appear to be helping Russia to uh, circumvent or overcome them, and in fact has been quite cautious in seeking to understand the limits of these sanctions so that its companies and firms do not get entangled in them, because that ultimately would be bad uh, for Chinese business and th something that China wants to avoid. Finally, militarily, uh, China's not providing, uh, so far as we can tell in open sources, uh, weapons or other material support for the Russian uh, war effort. Um, they may be providing other kinds of uh, sources that have not, or other kinds of support, excuse me, that have not yet been discussed. Uh, but uh, despite uh, some of, of, of the reporting earlier, uh, a few weeks ago, right, Ch China has not uh, sort of heavily backed uh, Russia uh, in this effort by providing um, what Russia may, may or may not have asked China to provide. So why is China doing this? I think there's probably three main reasons, but two of which are most important. The first is that China are, has grown quite close to Russia before the invasion occurred. I think it's important to stress uh, before the invasion. This culminated uh, in uh, Putin's visit to China on the event of the opening of the Winter Olympics and the issuance of a statement between the two governments on the 4th of February, uh, which I sort of described somewhat uh, jokingly as a list of shared grievances with the United States and the US uh, led order. Didn't contain a lot of action items, but did contain a lot of uh, complaints. And I think from China's standpoint, Russia and gr growing closer to Russia has been useful as relations with the United States have deteriorated and atrophied. And although China was hoping for a reset uh, with the election of President Biden in early 2021, that of course has not come to pass and the focus and pressure from the United States on China remains, which has elevated the importance of, uh, from Beijing's standpoint in terms of growing closer uh, with Russia. And towards the end of last year, you had uh, an effort by the United States to lead a boycott of the Olympics, and you had a, a summit of democracies uh, that was convened, albeit, um, I think, virtually. But nevertheless, I think China felt it was time perhaps to elevate its partnership. And so uh, we don't know what Putin said when he visited and spoke with Xi Jinping on the 4th. Uh, I don't believe he informed China of his intention to invade, and Chinese analysts did not believe that um, um, an invasion was forthcoming. And so I think China was probably snookered a little bit by Xi, in the, by, by Putin in this regard. Um, but nevertheless, it's very hard to unwind the very strong uh, uh, sort of position uh, China and Russia took in early February. Uh, the second factor here is related to the first, and which is the continued deterioration of ties uh, with the United States. I think China's approach to the to the conflict and how it talks about the conflict has not so much been to support Russia as it has been to uh, find uh, more ways to criticize uh, the United States. And so, for the last two years, China has countered sort of the U.S. narrative of China being a challenge to sort of the global rules-based order by portraying the United States as a source of global uh, instability and, and an unreliable country. And so China is viewing and sort of characterizing the Russian, or the, sort of the quote situation in Ukraine through this kind of anti-US or counter-US uh, frame, uh, which it has. And so this is why NATO gets so much attention, uh, not just because it is a Russian talking point, but also because uh, China has its own concerns about US alliances uh, in East Asia and the way in which they've been strengthened uh, in the last uh, one to two years and the elevation of the quad and so forth. And so this is a way of essentially kind of trying to delegitimate the United States and place the onus uh, for, of responsibility also on the United States for the situation uh, in Ukraine, however far-fetched that may seem uh, to the rest of us. Uh, 
And then finally, I think uh, another consideration has been uh, China does want to see continued global uh, macroeconomic stability. And I think uh, sort of challenging the sanctions or inviting the sanctions to come down on itself could have economic consequences that would go far beyond uh, what uh, China would be willing to stomach at this point, especially because this is uh, perhaps the most critical year in sort of the Chinese political calendar since reform and opening in 1978 uh, with the uh, 20th Party Congress that will be held this coming fall to sort of put in place arrangements that would consolidate Xi's third term and perhaps uh, cement his power for an even longer period to come. So what are some of the implications? Let me talk about implications for four areas. First, diplomacy. I think this has been a strategic blunder for China um, in many ways. Uh, China's, because of its concern about the United States uh, for the last years has tried to drive a wedge between uh, Europe and America. Uh, and over the past 12 months, culminating with the February 4th statement between uh, Russia and China, and then of course, China's uh, support for Russia uh, in the course of the invasion, uh, China has basically unified Europe against it in ways that were unimaginable uh, in December of uh, 2020, when China and the EU reached a, an investment agreement. Uh, it's not just about Russia, it's also about the treatment of European parliamentarians and being sanctioned over their views on Xinjiang. It's about China's treatment of Lithuania and other factors, but nevertheless, China has managed very successfully to alienate the one group of countries it was seeking to cultivate as part of its broader response uh, to the United States. I think diplomatically, it further strains ties with the United States. It suggests that China presents an even greater challenge uh, uh, to, to the future of stability uh, and international order because of the way in which it is seen as abetting uh, the Russian action by not condemning or opposing it. I think it also uh, does raise some interesting questions though uh, about China-Russia relations and whether or not there are in fact some limits on the no limits partnership because we haven't seen the military aid, we haven't seen an effort to break sanctions uh, and so forth. I think the implications for the developing world are more open. Uh, we primarily talk about this as sort of Europe uh, or and other advanced industrialized economies in Asia vis-a-vis uh, -vis their stance on China and Russia. But I think for the developing world, uh, China's narrative may have a, a little more purchase uh, than we might give it credit to. We don't really talk about that very much. Um, and then of course, the last implication here is simply the unity uh, of, of the advanced industrialized democracies around the world and the way in which uh, they've responded because that does have implications for China. Turning to some political implications, I mentioned this is a very important year in the Chinese political calendar. And in some ways, uh, being so closely associated with Russia and its destructive activity uh, in Ukraine and, and the destruction it's um, caused in Ukraine uh, and so forth, I think uh, could open up a potential to criticize Xi Jinping for mismanagement of a really important relationship at a time in which um, uh, he, he is seeking to put in place uh, arrangements to consolidate his power and position for many years to come. Uh, China during this year has a sort of, or in any year there's a party Congress prizes stability above all else. And in fact, we are seeing a quite unstable international order. And I think that's a, a challenge. Finally, turning to Taiwan, I think there are a couple of implications. First, uh, we haven't seen any opportunistic Chinese behavior. And so uh, there's sort of a trope that whenever the, the West or the United States is distracted elsewhere, China is going to uh, invade Taiwan or take some significant action against Taiwan. And yet again, that has not come to pass, which is not to mean it's a serious issue to consider, uh, but uh, certainly I think helps provide a broader context for thinking about Chinese calculations. I think in terms of a future conflict over Taiwan, though, I think China would be looking at the way in which um, this unity among the OECD states was so quickly formed uh, and, and able to act quite uh, decisively uh, is going to be uh, something that they would have to take into account going forward. Um, and, and especially in terms of the willingness uh, to place somewhat uh, broad economic sanctions, although not sort of total sanctions, since many folks are still buying um, uh, gas and, and oil from Russia. I think it also would raise questions in the mind of Xi Jinping of just how well prepared the PLA is to fight a high intensity conflict, uh, because any conflict over Taiwan is going to be much more complicated uh, than the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which essentially involved uh, moving combined arms groups across a land border. Um, and uh, of all those kinds of sort of modern military operations, this should be easier right than an amphibious assault, right? And so uh, I think there are going to be real questions being asked about, well, just how ready are you? Um, um, and, and, and that I think is, is, is an important implication. And then more broadly, just the uncertainty of war. 
right? China's not fought a war in 40 years. The last war in which they invaded Vietnam did not go so well. Um, and I suspect uh, this might also induce some caution uh, because it has revealed uh, the way in which um, um, no plan survives first engagement with the enemy. And this was a particularly bad plan. And so it was doomed to fail, uh, the, the Putin plan. But, but I think um, it just re reflects the uncertainty uh, uh, that, that is inherent in war uh, more generally. And though, of course, China is not going to abandon any of its ambitions with respect to Taiwan, it may be more cautious, uh, perhaps, in thinking about using the military instrument uh, in the ways in which um, um, it, it possibly could. So I'll wrap up here and look forward uh, to uh, the discussion period. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much, Taylor. Uh, turning it over to Roger. Okay. So I've been asked, I've been asked to talk about uh, insurgency. So I guess the first thing to do is to define insurgency. Uh, there are countless ways to distinguish among the closely related concepts of guerrilla warfare, unconventional warfare, irregular warfare, partisan warfare, and so on. But for the purposes of analyzing uh, Ukraine war, um, I'm going to define insurgency as war and, and by small, lightly armed bands, hit and run tactics, sabotage, avoiding set battles, and conducting operations behind a front line. This is in distinction to conventional war, which is regular armies fighting set battles along front lines. Now, when the war started six weeks ago, there was actually a lot more talk about insurgency then than now. And that is because the way the war is actually fought is very much a conventional war so far. Uh, six weeks ago, it was assumed that the Russians would win quickly a conventional war and the Ukrainians would have to turn to insurgency in either part or all of the country. Well, that, that really didn't happen. So what is the relevance of insurgency at the current moment of this unpredictable war? Uh, there's many scenarios. I'm gonna just um, uh, relate discussion of insurgency to just one of them. Uh, several analysts believe that the Russians are aiming for a frozen conflict. In the Russian version, this is where troops take a section of a target ter target's territory, establish a ceasefire, and then gradually establish longer-term control. The front lines are frozen, set battles stop. The occupier has time to consolidate control and wait for favorable terms and negotiations or perhaps favorable conditions to renew the war. And this is what we've seen uh, in Moldova and Georgia in Russia's Armenian ally in Nagorno-Karabakh and in the Ukrainian Donbass region from 2014 until the start of this war. So what is the relevance of insurgency in considering the possible implementation and success of Russia's um, frozen uh, conflict strategy? Well, on current strategic thinking, if the, Ukraine, if the Russians believe Ukrainians could produce an insurgency behind front lines, the Russians may be less likely to employ that strategy in the first place. Uh, there would be problems of consolidation of the territory, but they'd also need to deploy combat troops from defense of the front lines to police actions in the rear. And they'd have to be costs with little respite. There'd be domestic and international costs. So if an insurgency seems likely, uh, the Russians and Putin might be more willing to make con concessions in current negotiations or they could just try um, to take more chances for a decisive conventional victory now. Uh, I don't know what Putin really believes are the chances of a significant Ukrainian insurgency, but how should we think about it? Could the Ukrainians actually sustain an insurgency behind front lines? I think there's four uh, questions, uh, elements to this. One, is there a population willing to provide information and material uh, support to insurgents? Insurgents war is, is, much, is very much an information war. Um, related to that, the second point is, is there an absence of a population that's going to provide information and support to the occupying forces? Uh, third point is, local armed organizations, will they be formed 
there's a process of forming them around sort of first actors and, and local um, uh, leaders, and can they remain hidden and protected? And the fourth is just the level of uh, forces that the occupying force has, or are they able to maintain a presence in localities and able to conduct cordon and search operations, other counterinsurgent operations? So when we consider these, um, these four issues, uh, first we can think about demography. And it depends how big is this frozen area that the Russians might want. Would they try to take it all the way to the Dnieper River? Would they just um, basically freeze and, and maybe incorporate Luhansk and Donetsk? Would they try to expand the, their uh, operation over the Donbas? Uh, if they try to expand all the way to the Dnieper River, it, it, it doesn't seem like the Russians have enough troops to, to prevent an insurgency. Um, in Northern Ireland, the, the British government for 25 years employed about 32,000 security um, forces for a population of 1.6 million. That's a ratio of 20 per thousand um, residents, 20 security forces per 20 uh, per a thousand. At that percentage, Russia would require, or I mean, a, it's a, a one, one security force for 20 civilians. At that percentage, the Russians would require 250,000 troops just to control a region of, of 5 million. They don't have that many troops to devote to counterinsurgency. On the other hand, if they are just going to try to freeze the smaller area around the, the, the Donbass, um, they might be able to do that very well because one, the refugees, which we talked about here, internally displaced people, uh, it's who's going to be left in these areas. Mariupol was 430,000 people um, before the war. It's now estimated 130,000 civilians, probably lots of them old people are, are left there. And a lot of the conscripted soldiers are, are gone. So who is going to be left there? And uh, the, the size of it wouldn't um, be that, that big. Plus, I think the people who do stay, there's going to be a substantial number of Russian sympathizers or those who have, are going to make, a, make their, their life with, with, a, uh, with the Russians, and they'll be able to provide support and information. And so you may get what was, Crimea was a very easy occupation for the Russians. They could do that. But again, it depends upon Russian ambitions. And if they go for the smaller area, they don't have as much area to bargain in, in, in negotiations or bargain in a way. Um, could the Ukrainians form these local organizations? I think they could because they do have, have leaders coming from the territorial defense forces. Ukraine does have an idea about people's war or embedded special operations forces. And the members of these cells very possibly have training and weapons. Ukraine has had eight years of preparation for an asymmetric contest, and they have known that NATO will not come onto their territory, so they'd have to fend for themselves. Um, so I think uh, there's, there's local leadership in parts of these areas. They're going to get support, and the U.S. will support them. Uh, there's uh, U.S. really supporting insurgency is in the CIA's DNA. I mean, a lot of people don't like that, but that's a lot of what they do. Um, and the stingers and javelins are actually transportable, ideal weapons for hit and run and small group operations, which they've already shown they can do in the suburbs of Kiev. Now, on the downside, insurgent organization usually takes time to coalesce and adapt to it really was a fluid environment. If you look at Iraq and Afghanistan after the U.S. invaded, there was really a quiet period because the insurgents had to take you know, a year or two really to get up to speed. And that's, that's a, a normal, uh, normal phenomenon. Evading detection. On the Russian side, um, now there are drones, satellites, thermal imagery, but it's not clear how competent Russian forces are to actually use this in a counterinsurgency operation. Um, uh, and uh, Ukraine is not Afghanistan. Some people say, well, you know, the Afghans drove the Soviets out with Stinger missiles. The Ukrainians can do the same thing with javelins and Stingers in Ukraine, but it's a very different topography. 
Um, the Russians are using stand uh, off of weapons, uh, missiles, long range artillery. That's not what you can hit with, with the Stinger. And you have to remember the Soviets fought for nine years um, before uh, they left Afghanistan. So even with the demographic, organizational and weapons advantages that the Ukrainians might have, we should remember that insurgencies are very long. They're on average about 10 years, um, according to most studies. Insurgencies are bloody. Uh, in Chechnya, there's a population of 1.4 million and there were 40,000 civilian casualties. Insurgencies also involve a variety of units, some of them criminal or politically unsavory. The Azov Battalion and, and other forces are, are gonna be fighting uh, or find their way into the, this insurgency on the Ukrainian side. So the last, last couple of points, uh, some people ask, well, what about nonviolent resistance? Could there be another, if the Russians try to occupy and, and control, put down a government, could there be a orange revolution against this puppet government? Well, what, is, what Russia has learned about repression is repression works, but not in moderation. Uh, if you look at Syria and Chechnya. So I think the Russians will be brutal and likely effective against nonviolent resistance. And I just end by saying a lot of this is just really speculation. And anybody who actually says they know where this war is heading, uh, we should be skeptical of. Thanks. That's great, Roger. Thank you so much. Jim Walsh. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Walsh, and I study nuclear weapons at MIT Security Studies Program. I want to thank Michelle English and everyone at CIS for putting this panel together. I've learned so much as I have from Carol and Elizabeth about Russia over these many years. And it's obvious that Carol is a great facilitator. She runs a tight ship, which is no small thing, believe me. So thank you for that. I've been tasked with talking about the wider implications with respect to nuclear weapons. And I have several points I wanna make as I start my timer. One is, as Roger alluded to, the story is not over. And how it ends and how the ending is framed will shape the implications, will shape whether things go in one direction or another direction, and that story isn't over. And here I observe that I've already been surprised about what's happened in this conflict. I expect I will be surprised again, uh, that I will get things wrong. And so uh, if as we think about the implications, we need to bear in mind the uncertainty right now. Things could break in different ways. But given that, let me make some general points. One, the general theme when it comes to nuclear related stuff is that nuclear events tend to create cross-cutting impulses. Now for countries with nuclear weapons, that means for example, on the one hand, nuclear dangers produce the urge to hug your nuclear weapons more closely in a seemingly more dangerous world. Now I say seemingly because the nuclear weapons were always there, we just decided to ignore them for a long period of time and focus on proliferation, which is other people trying to get nuclear weapons rather than the countries with nuclear weapons. But those that have them in a, in a context of insecurity, some people will be drawn to want to draw them close. On the other hand, uh, for others, it encourages the conclusion that we've been uh, asleep at the wheel and really bad things could happen. Uh, not a lot of confidence in world leadership these days after COVID and all that has happened. So the prospects that uh, someone could use these nuclear weapons and we would be in a terrible world of hurt, that's actually on the table. And for those folks, the impulse is to reduce nuclear dangers. Some, some will pull them closer and closer and some will want to reduce them uh, as this is a reminder of what could happen in the future. So let me speak more specifically about a couple of areas. The first is US nuclear policy. Now for Biden, again, we have this cross current, cross cutting impulse playing out in the particular because uh, Biden on the one hand is very pro alliance. He's, you know, he's all about NATO alliance and South Korea, Japan alliance, and he's, he's an alliance guy. And he's also pro arms control. And in this case, those things are intention. The allies on the front line who depend on the U.S. nuclear deterrent want to see a forward-leaning, robust deterrent posture, which can come in conflict with arms control and disarmament. And we've seen that play out. And so far, I'd say arms control has been the loser on it, so far. 
What do I mean by that? Well, the first casualty of the Ukraine war for nuclear related issues was uh, Biden's uh, decision to end the pursuit of sole use. Now this is sole purpose. This is sort of getting into the weeds, but there's a debate in the US nuclear community, one-sided debate, but a debate nonetheless, that we should re-shrink and reduce the situations in which we would use nuclear weapons, therefore reducing the chances they will be used in conflict. And so what we should do is promise, as some have advocated, that we will use nuclear weapons solely for the purpose of deterring the use of other nuclear weapons or in response to nuclear weapons, not for other things. Because the US in the past has said, we'll use nuclear weapons for things beyond nuclear deterrence. Uh, so in that group, includes deterring chemical and biological weapons. And in the case of NATO during the Cold War, it was always US policy that if there was a big battle along the Eastern Front and the Russians who would uh, enjoy massive conventional advantages, if they started to crush our Western European allies, we would threaten and perhaps use nuclear weapons in the face of losing a conventional war. And this was something that would have said that Biden supported during the campaign, that we will only do nuclear for nuclear, nuclear deterrence for nuclear deterrence. Well, he chucked that. That's all gone. And I think the odds of us removing tactical nuclear weapons from Europe have diminished significantly for a period of time. I don't know how long, but it's going to be hard to take them out in the middle of a Russian war. Uh, I think the nuclear posture review, which the, was supposed to be released, is about to be released, whatever, will include no changes whatsoever that reduce the role of nuclear weapons. Maybe that's a little strong, but you get the general idea. And uh, Biden had pushed for some of that, but in the current political context and given where that plays out in the bureaucracy, that never had much of a chance of happening in my view to begin with. Now it has even less of a chance. I guess the good news for me, and I'm in the minority here, is I just don't think the nuclear posture review matters very much. I don't think Trump read the posture review, would have acted on it. I think when push comes to shove and there's a crisis, there are going to be other things going on. But in, insofar as that document's important, it will show no progress for arms control, if that's something you like. And I think for U.S. policy domestically, it means more money is going to be thrown at the Pentagon. And, and include, you know, and in that rush of, which has always been the case, right? Congress always approves more money than the Pentagon request. It'll do so again in fullness, fulsomeness. And some of that will go into things that are nuclear or nuclear adjacent like space. All right, let's shift from the US focus to arms control and disarmament more generally. And first we might think about US Russian bilateral arms control, the, you know, the core of arms control and disarmament activities during much of the Cold War, US bilateral negotiations, SALT and START and all that business. Well, at some point, I expect there will be an attempt to restart US-Russian nuclear stability talks. Uh, events so far and perhaps in the near term will demonstrate the need for that, but it's just really difficult to do under current circumstances. And I don't, and I think current circumstances could go on for a while. Well, I don't, you know, they could, Maybe they'll end quickly, but I think this is going to go on for a while, and I think that will continue to impede those conversations. But eventually, quietly, perhaps at first, but eventually the two countries will be pressed to talk again to reduce mutual dangers. Let's talk for a moment about multilateral arms control. And here one typically thinks of the Iran nuclear deal or the North Korea uh, problem, where you have a groups of countries, six or eight countries, depending on the situation, who are cooperating together to try to solve a nuclear problem. Well, I followed nuclear developments in Iran and North Korea for some 20 years. And one of the really sort of shocking aspects of that history is the degree to which Iran and North Korea have been kept separate and apart from other issues in the US-China and the US-Russian bilateral relationship. Now, you know, it's not a perfect vacuum and things spill over. But in the main, it's been sort of impressive that even when the US and China are at a low point or the US and Russia are at a low point, they're still able to sort of have enough cooperation based on mutual self-interest that they could make progress on Iran and North Korea as a separate thing. Uh, but now, for the first time that I remember, we are witnessing Russia trying to use its position in the Iran talks as leverage 
for sanctions against Russia. Now that didn't go very far, and I don't think it's likely to succeed, but it's definitely a crack in the wall. And you know, to some extent, it's not surprising. When you're at war, everything else is secondary. And Russia's at war, so they're gonna Putin's gonna make everything else secondary. But that's one of the new things we just saw. Let me talk for a moment, and I only have two minutes left, about Ukraine as a non-proliferation precedent. I, I think there's a lot of talk about that. So Ukraine gives up nuclear weapons, is promised that it won't be invaded, is invaded, and the invader makes nuclear threats while invading. So what lesson does that suggest for other countries? You know, are we going to see a rush of non-nuclear weapon states reconsider their options or other countries that are non-nuclear in alliances? And I say for right now, the answer is probably no. It's not clear to me that even though I get the logic that that's what happens in practice. As a practical matter, I don't think that's how policymaking works. There are large barriers to entry here for nuclear weapons. It's not so much the technology is tough. It's all the stuff you have to do to get ready for it that tells the rest of the world that you're developing nuclear weapons that puts you in their crosshairs. Now, I think my friends are going to write a lot of articles about the difficulties of extended deterrence and nervous allies. Uh, but, you know, nervous allies confront their own cross-cutting impulse. A more dangerous world may raise the value of nuclear weapons, but it also raises the value of a U.S. alliance. Nuclear might be nice if you're in that, that country and you think that way, but do you really want to go it alone with a nascent nuclear program that isn't quite finished while, and when you can settle instead for a U.S. alliance that gets you both the U.S. military and nuclear weapons? You know, I, I don't think, I think it's going to be very hard to beat that deal. It's been hard to beat that deal for a long time. I don't see that changing. And so Ukraine will stand as a horrible irony and tragedy, but I don't think it's going to have a material impact on non-proliferation. I mean, at the end, I, I want to say one thing. I was going to pull up a couple of graphs. I won't do it because it'll take too much time. Let me conclude with this, about this moment in nuclear history. There's limited empirical evidence that this is the highest salient nuclear event for Americans and English-speaking people since 2004. If you go to the Google Trends data, and if you think of searching on nuclear war as a rough metric for salience for how urgent a problem is, and I've played with different search terms, and I've gone, I plotted the peaks, and the peaks all correspond to nuclear shocks. The peaks since 2004 mostly happened uh, after President Trump was elected and involved President Trump in North Korea. That's when, you know, people were really, really nervous, the most nervous they've been in 20 years. And now Google Trends says that what's happening now has blown through that as the record and has topped that. So I think it is a moment of high salience for nuclear issues. And that creates opportunities for advocates of nuclear weapons who believe in nuclear deterrence. And it creates opportunities for people who fear nuclear weapons who think that this will lead to an extinction event and that you need to reduce and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons. You know, and I'm not going to say which way it's going to go, but I can tell you right now, it is a peak moment of saliency. We're going to get a North Korean nuclear test within the year. We're going to have some synergy between those events. And so this is going to, this could be a big nuclear year or a couple of years where things are in play. Let me pause there so that we can get to questions and answers. Thank you very much. So I'm going to pick up Elizabeth Wood here, uh, professor of Russian and Soviet history. Um, and what a wonderful panel. And we've got great questions coming in from the audience. I want to ask a question to our um, first speaker, to Jacqueline Baba, um, just to start us off. Um, we've had a couple of questions about what's happening with the refugees and in particular, um, the problems of uh, some one person asked about the people color who've been leaving Ukraine, what's happened to them and the experience of discrimination. Another important question I think is the question of trafficking of children and um, women, which you alluded to as a possibility. Um, the question could be, what do you think's really hap happening, Jacqueline? Um, can, you, can you fill us in on, on whether, whether we're seeing actual trafficking and, and what, what may happen? Um, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, and, and thank you to the, the um, lively audience in the chat. Um, so let me um, start with a you know, very good point about um, the, the African and other people of color um, 
um, residents, students and others from Ukraine who uh, have also been trying to flee. And it's a very important point, which I, I, I neglected to mention, just because numerically it is not um, as significant as so much else that we're seeing, but it's nevertheless important, unsurprisingly, um, discrimination and racism are, are alive and kicking at the borders uh, that um, surround Ukraine just like they are everywhere else. And I think in my comments, I did say how distinctive the response to Ukrainians has been um, by contrast with all the other large scale migrations that we've seen, forced migrations we've seen recently. Because, I mean, undoubtedly, there's a question of, of, of race playing out here very strongly. And so, yes, we have seen reports. I mean, I, I don't know the total number of people of color um, residents in Ukraine. I think, according to the Nigerian government, there are about 4,000 Nigerians. There are many students from Africa in Ukraine. And we have seen reports um, of discrimination, of pushback, of abuse, of, of um, people trying to prevent um, um, black and um, non-white um, students and others from boarding means of transport to escape. So undoubtedly, these these incidents exist, and um, it's 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 deplorable. I mean, what else can one say? It's it's um, unfortunately not surprising, but that's um, that is that certainly there certainly are reports. So I, I I'm, I'm glad that that point was raised, and it's a point very well worth making that even though the general picture here is one of, of enormous generosity and solidarity, racist divisions still show themselves. Um, in terms of children, um, I think the, according to, to UNICEF, there are about seven and a half million Ukrainian children. And um, according, as I said in, in my earlier comments, according to UNICEF, and that's my only source, um, about half of them have had to leave their homes. Some are IDPs internally displaced and others are, have crossed borders. Um, the majority with a parent, uh, but not all. Um, and there have been reports, there have been reports from human rights organizations that um, there have been incidents of trafficking. Um, these are not systematic reports. Nobody has actually, of course, done any systematic research. It's too early, but it's certainly in line with every other major incident we've seen where people um, helping people to cross borders um, are kind of cheek by jowl with people who are exploiting situations of vulnerability to make money, um, to, to sell children for sex, to sell, to, to capture children for adoption. We, we've seen this, uh, we saw this in Darfur, we've seen this in Haiti, we've seen this again and again in, in, in the big tsunami in Sri Lanka and other places. And so there have been reports that this is happening. I cannot point to particular um, traffickers or particular organizations that are involved. But um, it's, um, you know, there has been a lot of um, activity of traffickers in Eastern Europe for, for decades. And so it's hardly surprising that these, um, you know, abusive, exploitative phenomena are, are taking place in this, in this context. Thank you. Joel, we have a question for you about cyber, if you're still there. I'm here. Okay, good. I didn't see your picture. Um, several different people asked two sort of interrelated questions. One, what is the role of non-state cyber actors in all of this? And, you know, we've heard reports about anonymous and everything else hacking into Russia. And somebody asked a really important question, I think, about can we use some of our cyber technology or could some of these non-state actors use some of their cyber technology to get information into Russia? You know, the big report has been that the Russians, the average Russian citizen doesn't know the reality of the war. How do we break through that using our cyber technologies? Um, Non-state act, I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks the, that the Ukrainians have started a, an IT army. That, that is fundamentally um, a group of organized and semi-organized and unorganized private sector actors uh, hacking into Russian networks. And we've seen anonymous and other others from the outside. I don't have data on that, but I know that it's happening and it's happening quite intensively. It's a really good question. The next question about how do we get data into, the, into Russia? Um, Putin has closed down Twitter. He's closed, he's squeezed down um, everything that he hasn't closed down. Um, in order to control his information space. 
Friends of mine in Russia say that every 12 year old knows how to use a VPN now. I, I expect that's an overstatement, but I think what we're seeing in Russia is a further um, breakdown of the population between old and young in terms of what they know. Um, it's, this is a very hard question. And I, I, I think that the private sector and private actors uh, may have a substantial role to play, but I, I can't specify because I don't know what the particular channels are, would be best used and how successful the Russians could be in countering those channels. I expect that we will have a cat and mouse game here, but to a large degree, the Russians have closed themselves off. This will be hard. Great. Um, I, I will say that I have an MIT student who is studying cyber controls, and he has argued that uh, the Russians are on the verge of being able to uh, uh, block VPN. <laughs> this is uh, very scary. Uh, MIT students sometimes make very interesting studies. Um, some questions for Taylor. Um, the, what about the Russian um, uh, oil that is imported into China? Another question about Russian um, uh, uh, involvement in Chinese military hardware. Will Chinese send engineers to Ukraine for reparations? But also, you know, to what, where does Ukraine fit in the larger Belt and Road project of China? Um, is, uh, you know, are the, you, are, the Russia, are the Chinese concerned about their own uh, economic efforts? Great, so there's a, lot, there's a lot there. If I don't get to all of it, please uh, remind me. Um, so I guess firstly on the, the oil and gas, I mean, China imports um, just decent amounts of, of both from Russia. I suspect uh, that will continue and I suspect the price might even fall. So in that sense, uh, it would, from China's standpoint, it might be quite uh, positive, especially as there are fewer buyers um, elsewhere. Although China has been very careful to, I think, uh, purchase um, or not issue letters of credit in dollars, but rather just in Chinese currency. Um, but again, that's also an area that's not fully sanctioned more broadly. Uh, in terms of the Russian uh, sort of uh, or Chinese uh, military and dependence on Russia, China buys some very selective systems uh, from the Russians, notably uh, surface to air uh, missile systems such as the S-400. Um, but it doesn't really, it, it really manufactures almost all of its own hardware now. Uh, in some cases, it's reverse engineered Russian systems, such as the Su-27, which is a fighter aircraft that the Chinese call the J-11. Um, and in some areas like ballistic missiles and probably cruise missiles, uh, China's technology is probably uh, farther ahead of uh, Russian technology. So there is a lot of military dependence, although there is dependence on sort of specific systems. Uh, China's much less dependent uh, on Russia for military hardware than say India, for whom something like 60 to 70% of its advanced systems are all sourced from Russia, uh, which is the one, probably the main reason why India also has not condemned uh, uh, the Russian invasion as far as I know. Uh, in terms of the economic components, um, Ukraine is important for the Belt and Road, but in some ways Russia is even more or equally important for the Belt and Road uh, because of the rail routes uh, that would take goods uh, from China through Russia before then branching off into different European um, uh, areas. And so one of those branch lines would go into Ukraine, which would then go into other parts of, I think, Southern and uh, Central Eastern Europe. Uh, other uh, rail lines will go uh, into Northern Europe. And so it's not just Ukraine that matters here for China, but that um, uh, Russia actually matters in terms of the connectivity uh, portion of the Belt and Road. That said, the rail connectivity portion, um, I think, is a nice symbol of what China is trying to achieve in the Belt and Road. As a practical matter, container shipping is still going to be uh, much cheaper uh, than, than rail shipping, although it won't be quite as fast, but it will have much more capacity uh, than rail shipping. And so, so the loss uh, of access to these rail routes for some period of time, I don't think, is going to have a significant effect um, uh, on overall trade levels, all else held equal because of the ability of the Chinese to rely on their container shipping fleets. It just takes a little bit longer, uh, even though it's cheaper. Ukraine itself, though, is important for China for other reasons. Uh, China buys a lot of uh, grain from Ukraine, as do others. Um, and it's a way in which China has been able to diversify grain supplies away from the United States. 
Uh, Ukraine also has a very uh, sophisticated defense industrial base. And over the years, China has bought specific systems uh, that have been sort of engineered and designed and manufactured in Ukraine, most notably jet engines, which is a real deficiency in the Chinese Air Force. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, from a purely economic standpoint, the destruction in Ukraine is certainly not uh, welcome from, from, China's, from China's standpoint. So I think I've covered everything you you asked, Elizabeth, but uh, if not, uh, please let me know. Great, thank you. Um, we have a really interesting question about European dynamics and Roger, I think I'm gonna turn to you because the questioner asks about Serbia and Hungary, particularly in the recent uh, yesterday's elections there. Um, what does that portend for the unity of the Western Alliance against Russia um, on, in effect on behalf of Ukraine and what do you see going forward? Well, I mean, Hungary and Serbia are not exactly the major powers of, of Europe. Um, you know, bearing, being married to a, a Serb, someone of Serb, Serbian background, I can say that, you know, they got bombed for 78 days by NATO. So, you know, what do you want from, from yeah. Serbs? You know, they, and they're not that anti-EU. They'd like to belong to EU, but you don't really like people that fought what they consider an illegitimate war against you. There is some um, cultural affinity with the Russians, but I, I wouldn't actually overstate that. Uh, you know, one idea that this war was going to end illiberalism in European states, I think that's probably overblown, um, to tell you the truth. Um, and you can see that in Orban, you can see that in Serbia. I'm not sure that we're gonna take that lesson. A lot of people sort of were thinking, well, uh, you can't be connected to Putin and survive. But, uh, you know, I think um, given the, the oil dependence and all that, a lot of people are, are thinking, well, you got to be realistic with this. So it's not, it's not clear again where the domestic politics in, in Western Europe go. Um, but, you know, it's no doubt that the, uh, the Ukrainians have won the information war and um, that they've uh, solidified um, uh, Western Europe. Although, you know, looking at how wars go, uh, I'm not sure that after another month that this is going to be, it's going to be routinized. People are going to get tired of Zelensky, actually. I mean, right now he's a hero, but there's only so much you can, you can try to um, use guilt against people. Um, and we'll, we'll see where this goes. And that's why if it goes into some frozen conflict and certainty. This could be years and years of, uh, of war. Uh, the sanctions, uh, you know, talking about Serbia, US had completely destroyed Serbia's economy. It didn't change the outcome of the war or anything. And, and Milosevic only was out of power in Serbia after he lost the war of Kosovo. So if, if I were Putin to look at that, it's like I can withstand sanctions, but I can't withstand losing a war, which is just going to make this thing go, go further and further, actually. All right, let's, let's take a question, a couple of questions for Jim Walsh. Um, we've got a question, if Russia uses tactical nukes, what should, how should NATO and the US respond? Which I think is related to another very, very important question. Should the U.S. get more involved diplomatically? Um, and what about pressure between uh, NATO and the U.S.? How, how are there are there diplomatic ways that this can be headed off? Um, and then, and then the last question is: um, you, It's not quite your field, nuclear power plants, but I have definitely heard people arguing that having nuclear power plants in the way of potential uh, strikes might be an argument for trying to wean countries off of, of nuclear power. And I'm curious if you have a thought about that. So um, yeah, how to respond if there's tactical nuclear weapons by Russia? All terrific questions. I probably won't give them the treatment they deserve. And certainly the first question in, uh, on US, uh, on Russian use of tactical nuclear weapons and a US response will be, very unpleasing to people. I think it's, I think in the main, we should expect that the US will be quite reluctant to respond to a US tactical weapon used, a Russian tactical weapon uh, 
used in Ukraine, not involving NATO. But let me say, uh, this is gonna very much depend on the circumstances. Uh, it, it, you, you can theorize about, you know, might Putin do this? And then what you find out as life plays out, it really is the, the details that sort of drive this. And so let's say there's some scenario where the reason why you, Putin's using tactical nuclear weapons is he's losing. He's facing the prospects that Roger just suggested. And somehow this thing gets away from him and he's about to suffer an enormous defeat. And he, you know, hits a Ukraine military target, a target as a demonstration shot, you know, or, or maybe against a very small military target, which is still using nuclear weapons and killing tens of thousands of people, but it's not attacking a city. I think, you know, if the U.S. believes that it can win and enforce punishment conventionally without having to resort to nuclear weapons, it will do that as much as it can. Once you cross the line into retaliation, there's a you know you're in a whole new world. Now, let me say, having talked to this very about this very scenario in class this semester, I am teaching in the physics department. That you might reasonably ask, well, if, if Putin uses a nuclear weapon and and we don't respond, does that make the world safe for the use of nuclear weapons? Is the lesson drawn that others can do it? That he could do it again if he got cornered and started to lose. And those are serious questions. Uh, and there aren't very, you know, there aren't great answers here. And this is one of the reasons why I think we should be reducing nuclear weapons is that we're in a domain where basically there aren't a lot of good choices. Should the US be involved diplomatically? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you have to stay with diplomacy because you don't know when it's going to happen and mature and ripen to a point where it's going to be meaningful. And if you have to wait to the point where it's exactly ripe to do it, then you won't be ready to take advantage of the moment. So it's a constant thing, even though it's fruitless most of the time. And as for nuclear power plants, that's unlikely to mean the end of nuclear power. Nuclear power, there's a big debate whether it's good or bad. My own assessment, having studied it recently with respect to laser enrichment, is the economics do not point well. The industry's own numbers have them declining. Their best, you know, staying, staying the same is their best 30 year prediction at this point, International Nuclear Institute but they're probably gonna decline because they're not cost competitive. So this adds to those reasons, but I don't think it's gonna be something that's really a driver. Nuclear power will win or lose, survive or not survive based on whether it can economically and maybe for climate uh, you know, deliver on its benefits. And that's always been the problem. So let me stop there. Great, thanks, Jim. Uh, Taylor, we have a couple more questions for you on China's role. Um, one questioner asks whether or not ultimately China would help Ukraine to rebuild and would send engineers, et cetera. Would they be willing to take that risk? Would it aggravate the Russians? And another questioner asked, how dependent is China on Russia's military technology? I know that they've had some joint um, production agreements and everything else. What is the relationship between the two militaries at this point and how does that impact the crisis? Um, thanks, Carol. So on the uh, question of helping uh, Ukraine rebuild, I think China would be, uh, and Chinese firms in particular, would be quite willing to do so. And they may have some natural competitive advantages uh, that they have, uh, you know, developed uh, through various Belt and Road style investments and in infrastructure and so forth. I don't think China would necessarily shy away from that, especially because of this sort of pro-Russian neutrality. Helping Ukraine rebuild is something I think China could get behind while still at the same time uh, wanting to uh, maintain um, its, its uh, ties with Russia. That said, I don't think that they would perhaps go into the most dangerous areas. Um, in terms of ties between uh, the Russian and Chinese uh, militaries, at the technical level, um, China buys very select systems uh, from uh, the Russians, uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, notably surface to air missile systems. There's some cooperation in terms of early warning defense systems and so forth. But in the main, China buys much less uh, than it uh, purchased, say, in the mid 1990s or in the mid uh, 2000 aughts. China makes all of its own surface combatants uh, for its uh, naval forces. It, it manufactures and designs all of its armored forces. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so it really, uh, the other area would be in, in very advanced uh, fighter aircraft, uh, the Su-35s are still uh, systems that China purchases 
uh, from Russia, but it's a small share of their own overall weapons imports. And China overall is not a big importer of weapons anymore. And, and here there, there's a stark contrast uh, with, with some other countries around the world. The ties between the Russian and Chinese militaries beyond technology are growing. I mean, you have um, sort of an increasing frequency of joint exercises between the two over the last 10 years, culminating uh, most notably in exercises that were held in the last two years, which were which sort of featured a larger uh, Chinese participation and some uh, willingness to exercise uh, in the areas of combat operations and not just humanitarian assistance and so forth. And so it's a growing relationship, but it's growing from a pretty small base. Um, and I wouldn't say necessarily it's particularly close. And I think, um, you know, despite the February 4th statement and the political or the areas of political agreement between China and Russia, I think the Chinese military probably does watch sorry, the Russian military, excuse me, watches uh, the Chinese military with some sort of concern. I mean, uh, nevertheless, the relationship's good enough, right, that Russia moved most of its forces from the Far East and put them in Ukraine, right? So China has enabled Ukraine in a way, which is to say that you, uh, Russia in a way over Ukraine, which is to say that Russia has, has absolutely no concern about any vulnerabilities in its East uh, because of this political relationship. And the troop movements, I think, made that abundantly clear. Thanks. Okay, so we're coming toward the end of an absolutely fascinating uh, panel about you know, the many different aspects of this war. One thought I had for a way to end it is to ask each of you, our speakers, to go back and think about two questions, and one might be better for you, but, um, and go in the order that we have you presented. Is this a different kind of war from the perspective of each of your topics? And do you see a way to end this war relating to your topic? Are there ways that uh, knowing what we know about refugees, uh, cybersecurity, uh, China, nukes, uh, and, and insurgency, that we can, is there anything we can say about how this could end? Um, so let's start with, again, go in the order we, we've spoken. Jackie, can, what, what do you want to leave the audience with about this as a kind of war and as a potential end? Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I would say, um, from the point of view of refugee protection, there are enormous similarities, but also differences to previous uh, wars. The similarities, of course, are the extraordinary human suffering and the dramatic disregard for uh, the protection of innocent civilians, which we see increasingly in war and the implications this has for, for, for disruption of life, not only now, not only in the short term, but possibly for several generations. That's the commonality. Um, the difference is, as I said, the extraordinarily generous response from the European Union, which really stands in stark contrast to the response of any global North um, state or region to any large refugee um, crisis of the last post-war period. So that's the difference. That's, um, that's uh, kind of what's um, encouraging, if you like. In terms of bringing this conflict to a conclusion, um, you know, obviously, and I'm no expert on this, obviously, um, there has to be a diplomatic solution. And uh, I think the experts that you've invited are, are better positioned to answer that. But in terms of the enormous scale of human suffering, one can only hope that, um, that, that something happens really soon. And in the meantime, that humanitarian corridors, at least as a minimum, are protected. Joel? Every war is different. Um, I think one of the things that's clear in this one is that, this, insofar as cyber is concerned, that it's it's an aspect of war that uh, is going to be involved in every kind of conflict, whether shooting breaks out or not, and certainly again after it breaks out. But that after it breaks out seems to become a lot less important. That's one thing we've seen. It seems to me, though, that we're looking at the warfare in, in, in Europe now. It looks to me back to the future. We we have got past the idea that warfare between states, modern states, is impossible because of nuclear uh, weapons. We're now seeing warfare that looks like old-fashioned warfare over borders, looks a lot like 
warfare from the 1860s in Europe or um, 1870 in Europe. Um, and, and as for ending it, it, ending it with a border adjustment created by force is contrary to everything all of us th thought we thought about international relations um, in our adult lives. But that is how it might happen. Whether an adjust, a border adjustment would be acceptable to Ukraine is really the question. And, and I don't think that could happen until after, you know, to the 13th or 14th round of a 15 round fight. We're not there and won't be there soon. And I think I'm afraid that I share Roger Peterson's um, view that this is gonna be long, it's gonna be nasty, it's gonna be involved in a lot of human suffering. And remember also, it's hard to think about this given what the Russians are doing now, in the long run, we're not interested in isolating Russia. The question is, can Russia be incorporated into what we in the West think of as a civilized international order? Because if not, we're either driving them permanently, or whatever that means in international relations terms, but in the long term into the arms of the Chinese, which is not in our interest, or we, divide, or we create them as a, as a um, even separately as a volatile, unsatisfied, revanchist state, which will continue to cause trouble. We don't want that. Good points. Okay, let's turn it over to Taylor. Um, so uh, in terms of the war itself, uh, I agree with Joel, every war is unique. I think one notable aspect of this conflict is it's certainly for American audiences. Um, it's been a war in real time. I mean, you can go on social media and basically follow the fighting in many places. Um, I think it's a distorted view. Um, it's not necessarily an accurate view, but, but uh, even with the last crises involving Russia, I don't think it was this way. And so this is a new aspect of war um, that makes it seem more immediate, more pressing, um, and, and so forth. On how it will end, I'll comment on China's role. Um, I don't think China will play a big role in the conclusion of the war uh, because that would require China playing a role in, um, you know, uh, sort of directly sort of assuming a leadership role in, in, in mediating a dispute in which it sees as being very far away from itself. I think this, this also means that we should not expect China immediately to seek global leadership in many other areas, because of course, one has to take risks to be a global uh, leader. Uh, and this is an area where they've clearly shied away from leadership, even though perhaps having some potential uh, leverage uh, that they could use to bring about its conclusion. So I think it will really probably be a consequence of a hurting stalemate on the battlefield and China may help on the margins, but won't be decisive in its resolution. Okay, Roger, let's get your perspective on is well, I mean, idea? the shocking thing is just how this is a conventional war. And um, it looks, uh, things are, city is going to be bombed back to rubble like it uh, Warsaw was. Joel goes back to 1870, but you could, you know, we're talking about the same things in security studies, really, is offense, defense, dominance is, you know, the same kind of concepts we were like 40, 50 years ago when I was, well, I'm only 62, I guess, so not 40 years ago when I was in college, still the same stuff, you know? So I think that's the interesting thing about it. And we don't seem to have norms about who, killing civilians. That hasn't even changed. That, you know, that's just going on. But where is this going? Um, one of our key pieces we teach people in war classes is uh, an article called The Rationalist Theory of War. And it's an article by Jim Furon. But the idea is that wars can't end until both sides have sufficient information about the capabilities and resolve of the other side. And in fact, one of my recent PhD students um, is now the director uh, for Western Europe for the National Security Council, Lieutenant uh, Colonel um, Tim Wright. Another one of our grad students meet him down in Washington, and he says, you know, I use that article every day. Professors like to hear this, right, that they actually teach stuff that's relevant. But I use that article every day to think where this war is headed. 
And, and where is there going to be a point where the information, where both sides are clear, Taylor references with a herding stalemate, that both sides become clear that this is our capabilities, that's their capabilities, that's their resolve, our resolve, and then you can come to negotiations. We are not close to that point. People, uh, both side, no, no side is, is found out what the capabilities are. I don't, I still don't understand the Russian capabilities. I keep thinking that they're going to get smarter and they're going to do better and they don't. And maybe it's because they don't have the capability or, you know, I don't know, but it seems that they have um, capabilities they haven't used very effectively. Now, are they going to use them effectively or not? I, we don't know. So, the war is going to go on until until we have some clarity, and that that is not even on the, the short term horizon. Yeah, we, we may also want to remember that Russia has done spectacularly badly in the Crimean War of the 19th century, in the Russo-Japanese War. It's certainly capable, of, but we'll see. But you're definitely right, um, Jim. What what do you want to tell us about how to see this war and its possible end? Is this war different? I think if you ask Putin, he would say, no, I'm fighting the same way I did in Syria and Chechnya. I'm going to use brutality and I'm going to destroy a bunch of stuff. Sadly, no one cared about that, right? So what's different is the location, that it's on the doorstep of Europe and that people are paying attention and will likely pay sustained attention. I think that's the difference. Uh, you know, there's been, it's, we've had brutal wars, but we haven't had brutal wars in Europe. So as for nuclear, you know, I go back where I started. Uh, we can't really judge the implications until the thing finishes, because whether it finishes, if it finishes badly for one party or the other, lessons will be drawn. And that will depend on the framing of why it happened the way it did. And those will be the lessons drawn. I, I don't think we'll see a use of nuclear weapons, but as I said in my talk, this is a moment, arguably the highest moment in 22 years of salience for concerns about nuclear weapons. And then the question is, what is that attention and what is that emotion and concern, what does that translate into? And, and, and it can go in different directions, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to thank all of our speakers um, for a great conversation about the wider implications of the war in Ukraine. Unfortunately, as everybody has said, it's not ending anytime soon. So we may, re we may reconvene to continue this conversation. I would also like to remind our audience that we have one last Focus on Russia seminar, which will be uh, April 25th, and our speaker will be Vlad Zubov, who's written a brilliant book about the Gorbachev era and actually the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. And I wanted to also thank Michelle English and Laura Kerwin for their behind the scenes help and actually putting helping us put all of this together. And that's the end. And hopefully everybody will be well and we will go forward. Take care, everybody. <laughs>